Hey, it's Mike Broomhead. We are at Four Peaks for another one of our Four Peaks sessions. And uh, joining me here, we're going to talk about soccer, and I'm going to get an education because growing up in the South, I'm a football guy, but I, nobody can live in the United States now and not be a soccer fan. Phoenix Rising is the team, new ownership, new blood, so let's go down the line. We'll start with Burke first. You are the governor of the team, principal and owner of the team, Correct. and kind of the brains behind the whole outfit, right? Isn't that what you told me what to say? <laughs> right? <laughs> Just a small part of the equation. Okay, okay. And Jim, of course, Jim, one of the primaries here at Four Peaks and also part owner in the team. Correct. And you're the one that really educated me on the love of soccer and what you've, you love the sport. Yeah. I've, uh, you know, back in when I was 10 years old, I was the ball boy for the LA Aztecs, which was an NASL team all back when it was a professional team. And um, I got to you know, hang out with Elton John and Georgia Best. And ever since then, um, I've been a huge soccer fan and supported a lot of soccer intramural and, and uh, men's leagues here in uh, Arizona. And last but not least, another board member of the team and owner is uh, Tim Reister. Welcome, uh, all of you. Thank Thanks you, for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, let's talk about the new ownership and what the direction of the team is going because here's what's happened. All of a sudden, you're driving on the 202 and you look over one day and there's a huge stadium there. And everybody's wondering what the heck is going on. I mean, you built this stadium very quickly, so you guys mean business. You mean business with this, don't you? Tell us what's new, what's going on. Sure, Tim, do you want to get us started? Sure, well, we, uh, the three of us and, and a number of other partners who joined us acquired uh, this, this soccer team, this Arizona's professional soccer team, uh, back in August of 2016. And it, it's been an incredible seven and a half months since acquiring this organization. We, we wanted to, to make it anew and bring Arizona the highest level of professional soccer uh, ever before in the history of the state. Uh, to do that, we had to provide a soccer complex that would be worthy of the, t the type of players we recruited. Uh, we've been fortunate to bring in some of the very best I in the world. You'll hear more about that oh, later. Yeah. But um, yeah, this, this construction project was unbelievable. We brought in Kitchell and we brought in a number of the vendors who are experienced at the Phoenix Open. And you know, they, these guys know how to put on a show and how to put it up quickly and make everything top quality. So we, we brought them in as, as our development partners. We worked with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community and a development, a development arm there called the Solano Group. And we secured 45 acres for 70 years. So we have the, right there at the cross sections of the 101 and 202 freeways, the most ideal spot for a stadium, I think in the history of Arizona. Anybody can get there in about 20 minutes from anywhere in the valley. And as a result, we've sold out our first two games. So it's, it's a dream come true for us. It's kind of cool to fly into Sky Harbor because you can't, can't miss it. it. You can't, can't miss it. that stadium and the bright red. And so what's the capacity for the stadium? It's about 6,200, but uh, we have some standing room only sections. Our first match was about 700 over capacity and our second match was about 100 to 150 more uh, over that capacity with the standing room only uh, places. And one thing I'd like to highlight, if I was looking at this attendance numbers from last year, our attendance so far in the first two home games is up about 380%. Oh, is that all? From, from where we have purchased the team. So obviously the Valley is really responding to some of the investments that we have made and we're very gracious for that. Well, I know that I'm behind the curve because I, I don't know as much about soccer. My nephews, my nieces, all are huge fans and play. Now they like basketball and other sports, but they love soccer. And you can't go anywhere without watching kids playing soccer on fields now with some of the injuries in other sports. But aside from that, it's an international game. So there are educated people that love the game. Do you think it's the quality you're bringing now that's bringing the fans? I mean, these are knowledgeable fans that know a good team when they see one, right? For, for, for sure. And it's not, uh, you know, if you look at who we have brought in, you're talking about Sean Wright Phillips, has years of experience in, in Chelsea, Omar Bravo, who's the leading scorer of Chivas in Mexico and over 60 times uh, playing in the national team. And uh, our latest addition, who will join us uh, this Friday is uh, Didier Drogba. And uh, you know, obviously Didier is um, not only, uh, if you, look, you really need to understand who he is, there's a soccer part of him, which uh, in many people's opinion, he is one of the best that uh, ever played a game of his generation. Uh, you're talking about somebody that won uh, Champions League Cup, not only won the Champions League Cup, but actually had the you know, uh, winning goal. It was, he was man of the match. During that, you're talking about four league titles, four FA titles, all with Chelsea. You're talking about a couple of titles in 
Turkey. You talk, talking about three World Cups, over 100 caps uh, with Ivory Coast, uh, his native country. So that's the soccer part of it. Um, but then uh, as a human, as a leader, talking about somebody that was on the cover of Time magazine as one of the top 100 in influential people in the world. So uh, I'm honored to, to call him a partner uh, like these gentlemen here and to be able to bring him here, show him uh, what we have done and what we're going to do on our road to MLS as we are competing with 11 other cities and convince him on our vision and not only convincing him but also bring him here with his family, participate as a player and then then on as an owner in, in our journey to MLS. So that's a big deal. I was here when uh, I was here actually interviewing the governor Mr. for governor, one of these yes. and we had lunch with all of you and with Didier and it was, it was talking to him about your vision so to land someone like that shows anybody that doesn't know the seriousness of what the people that know the sport believe in what you're doing here. That's amazing stuff. You gotta be very proud of what you've done so far. So you are now in what would be considered, would be the second division two? Am I, I don't know yes. if I'm saying that right. That's correct. But you are now bidding against with 11 other teams for four franchises to be MLS. Correct. When would that, how soon could that happen? So um, it, MLS, in my opinion, going to take about probably by the end of the year to make a decision. Right now, they're all digesting the information that's coming from different cities. And frankly, it's music to our ears that, um, that the decision is even later this year. If you consider how much of a latecomer we are to the party, but the amount of disruption that we made, I think it's time is on our side to be able to continue to prove more sellout games, which we certainly need our fans to continue to come and support and continue to integrate what we have done and showcase it. But MLS has a very, uh, I mean, City of Phoenix has very unique advantages competing with other 11 cities. Um, and I don't know if you want to Yeah, I mean, Arizona, Phoenix is the sixth largest media market, um, the very large Hispanic market. Um, and, and, you know, you compare that to some other cities that are vying for, for MLS, let's say Cincinnati, Sacramento, um, you know, a lot of the smaller uh, uh, markets. Um, Really, there's no reason why Phoenix doesn't have an MLS team. It, it should have had a team years ago. You know, you look at uh, 60,000 people at the Uruguay-Mexico game at the uh, University of Phoenix Stadium. So you know that there's that demand. I think the, one of the problems is the summertime. So we are mandated to build an indoor stadium, air conditioned, because that's you know, player safety, also uh, fan safety. Um, so we have that design. And um, that's the biggest hurdle, because in July, you're going to want to be inside watching the game, but it's, the, the design is a nice, clear roof, you know, with, let the sun right. come in. Um, so that, that was a hurdle. Um, and the other thing is just that we just, they, they couldn't get the team off the ground um, until we came in and, and uh, rebranded it, you know, through, through uh, Reister. And, and, um, and our chances now, I mean, they went from zero to, you know, to, to, I don't know what now. There's actual odds that people make on that. And, and we went from literally bottom of the list to the top of the list. And, you know, I, I'm going to borrow from, uh, I'm, <laughs> bet on yourself, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to borrow a quote from our newest partner from Didier Drogba. And he said uh, that there is no city better positioned than City of Phoenix to be an expansion, expansion city for uh, MLS. And MLS actually put that on their website. Uh, two, two, three days ago and, and, and highlighted that. And a couple of things to add uh, to Jim's excellent points. If you think about it, media is what drives the franchise valuations. So if you are the 24 other folks sitting on a table and making decisions on who's going to be your new partners at MLS, for everybody's wealth creation, City of Phoenix is, is a must-have market um, because of uh, it, its media presence. And there is no other MLS team within 300 miles on either direction. So you have Dallas and you have LA and you have a big gap in the middle. So we think we're in the right place, right time, right ownership group and uh, really executing towards that. But all of you are businessmen and you know that you, even if everything is right in this area, there's nobody that's gonna say, okay, we're gonna do this without the right partners. Correct. And so you've kind of moved, put in motion some of these things to make them know, A, you're serious, and B, you're ready if they say yes, that you can make the jump and make it happen. How quickly then would you have to move to get that stadium that you're talking about built and what would be the capacity that you would hope for for an MLS stadium? What, what, what capacity would that be? Yeah, about, we're looking to build a 22,000 to 25,000 seat stadium. Interestingly though, the designs we have on the table are scalable. 
So the, the roof structure is such that it can, it can move up and allow us to add more seats when the market's ready uh, to, to put more fans than 22,000 in the stadium on a regular basis. Uh, it will take us about two and a half years to build the stadium. The great news is the dirt's ready uh, and we're already operating on the site. So if you think about improvements to the site, sewage, water, electrical, it's all in, it's all ready to go. The, the MLS stadium will be built where our parking lot is now. There's about a 17 and a half acre parking lot that is currently servicing our stadium. We have uh, land all surrounding it that we haven't uh, activated yet, but we'll move our parking to the, to the neighboring land as we, as we start building it. So we'll be able to continue playing games in our current stadium while the MLS stadium is under construction. And how cool is it, the location again, Two freeways, north and south, east and west, which any team would kill to have access Three, to. 300,000 cars per day. And to be able to get in and out, the right. access to and from, plus the district around here with the entertainment and things to do after the games. It, it seems like such a home run that it, it, I don't want to jinx it, but it seems impossible that they can't look at this and say with the right partnership, this should, this should rocket into what would be a great franchise, right? Yeah, and MLS is fairly public on that. You know, they talk about three big criteria. Talking about the right city, you know, right ownership and right stadium solution. So I, I again, I know that they're happy with our ownership group on what we were able to accomplish so far. But again, we're at the beginning of our journey. We need to put our head down and continue to execute. I don't think there's any debate about the city. Uh, you're talking about the largest population, largest media market, um, and largest expected population, largest Latino population. So there's no debate there. And, and I, I don't think there's a debate on the uh, stadium solution. You're at the busiest intersection potentially of the state, most premium location, and you have a soccer specific location that it's under contract. Uh, so it's not waiting for some public funding or other approvals, uh, it's show already. Now the other franchises and the other major sports teams do a lot with youth trying to get them interested. What then would you be, are you looking at or are you doing as Phoenix Rising with youth soccer around the state of Arizona? The youth are incredibly important to us in our long-term plans. And in fact, one of the reasons Didier Drogba joined us is his commitment. He, he's looking at how can he help affect positively kids throughout the United States and North America and, and give them the joy and the culture of soccer that he was raised with. And, and we've made a commitment to him the same way we're making a commitment to our surrounding community that we're going to create a path for, for kids. Currently, if you're a superstar soccer player, once you go to college, you can't play professional soccer at the highest level in Arizona. You can play Division II with us. That's why we're going to get this up to MLS. We want kids to be able to play the highest level of soccer right here, be able to stay near their families, and continue to grow this thing together. To do that, we're going to be developing more fields. So you're going to see more green grass popping up around the, the Phoenix Rising Soccer Complex. We're going to be engaging multiple clubs throughout the valley, even in Tucson. We're already in conversations. The, the gentleman who runs the programs down in Tucson is one of the best, John Perlman. Uh, he's also the leader of uh, uh, FC Tucson down there. He's a great friend and colleague of ours, and, and we're working with him and, and being advised by him to make sure we can bring everybody in the state under a professional organization and create the path for children. So soccer in the U.S. has been uh, the one that what has been lacking has been the blue chip and superstar athletes play the other major sports. And in other parts of the world, anytime you're a, pre a premier athlete, you gravitate towards a sport. I got to meet Didier that day, and he looks like any NFL superstar. You would be. He is definitely a professional athlete. So you look at the potential of 10 years from now, the next Larry Fitzgerald may not put on a Cardinals uniform, but may put on a jersey for Phoenix Rising. That's got to be the goal for a lot of people to make this sport what other kids want to play professionally someday. Yeah, there's no, no reason why the U.S. can't be top five international. Our athletes are the best in the world, and they're going to play other sports. Odell Beckham, he's an awesome soccer player, but, you know, NFL pays. Um, Nash, you know, from the Suns, that guy's an excellent soccer he loves player. Soccer. Yeah. yeah, he plays out in L.A. with some of those L.A. clubs that we play against. Um, so once we can get some of these athletes to keep soccer and to learn soccer, soccer is a tough sport to learn. You know, a lot of guys don't pick up football until later in their life. Soccer, you've got to have those foot skills from the beginning. So these guys got to start young. But if we can get some of these athletes that we have in other sports playing soccer at a very young age, then World Cup-wise, there's no reason we should be losing to Trinidad, Tobago, and Jamaica. I mean, we need to be top five. And I see that in my lifetime. And uh, I hope someday to, to win a World Cup. I think next World Cup, we, you know, that basically, uh, you know, after Russia and Qatar, 
that I'm speculating that it's going to be here with uh, Canada and Mexico. Yeah. I think that's going to be a huge catalyst as the previous one was for the sport. If you look at the statistics, during 1970s, there were about 100,000 kids across the United States that were registered as a player. Now that number is 3 million. So it's cer certainly the population growth wasn't 30 fold in, in right. those years. So you're already seeing the, uh, the interest towards the sport. And as interest grows, and potentially as the other sports have peaked, because as you mentioned, some of the safety issues, I think all of those uh, dynamics that you mentioned are going to change in the, you know, in the favor of uh, uh, soccer and Phoenix Rising, and I'm hoping to put one of those jerseys we, to, to we, the stars uh, like you. Mentioned. We, um, growing up, we're a football family. My youngest brother was a superstar athlete growing up. He's got a son that looks just like him at that age, and he's worried about him playing that sport, mm -hmm. yeah. but so he put him in other sports, and this kid loves soccer. Scored three goals in his first game match just recently and just absolutely loves it. And so I'm thinking, is that going to be the generation now he's nine? Yeah. When he's 19, if he's the same athlete my brother was, is it going to go to college on a, a soccer scholarship sure. as opposed to looking at football, baseball, or basketball? Right? Sure. Well, I think you're describing Tim's or my kids. Yeah. And kind of that with, generation. Without question, and, but I'm going to tilt it the other direction for a minute because there are a lot of parents who, who think, oh, my kid will never be the top soccer player in the United States. So here's the reason why I believe and we believe soccer is so important for kids. You get thousands and thousands. In Arizona, we have hundreds of thousands of kids playing recreational soccer. We have over 50,000 playing competitive level soccer. How many of those kids will make it to the highest level? Who knows? But here's what's happening today. Those kids are fit. They want to eat healthier. They can sit in class and concentrate because they're running several miles every night after school. And as, especially with boys, right? The yeah. best thing, you, boys are like horses. You gotta take them out and run them and then they can <laughs> calm down, they can listen, they can absorb the information in class. So we're creating better students, we're creating healthier lifestyles. And those kids, when they're our age, they're not gonna have back problems and posture problems because their core, their core strength from this sport is gonna be their intramuscular strength will hold their spines up and these guys aren't going to be hunching over, waking up every morning and saying, my back hurts. Like my you know? partner, Andy, that's uh, playing football for ASU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right, exactly. Exactly. But, no, I, yeah. I, and I think, you know, if everyone talks about millennials, but the attention span, um, I think, of sports fans now has shrunk. Um, Four-hour football games, I mean, I think, I think it's painful for me to watch when they have all the timeouts and the red flags and the over over analysis and was he in was right. he out i don't have time it's crazy golf right now is kind of on the outs because it takes you know, all day to do um, baseball is a very cerebral long game soccer is great i get up saturday morning i watch my favorite manchester united play hour and a half the game's over i have my whole day to go out um, that's what's great about it 45 minute halves no timeouts 15 minute halftime the game's over i mean i just i think that you know for the for the millennials and the newer age I think that's, that's kind of right down uh, where we're going. There are a couple of things in soccer that I love when I watch, and I am as casual a fan as there can be. So, But watching the sportsmanship, but also the competitiveness. There's definite rivalries. There's chest bumping and sometimes in each other's face on the match. But when it's over, the exchange of jerseys, the handshakes, the, the sportsmanship of the co competition really is great for kids and that's what I would want my nephew and for kids to see is that there is a level of competition where you want to win but when it's over there's mutual respect for the, your, your adversary and I think that that soccer really encompasses that doesn't it? Absolutely. So do you when you look at what's happening let's talk about Didier for a moment okay. because we, you were just talking about character of people yeah. what he's done in his country as a, a promoting his country and, and the poverty and exposing what's happened there to bring in someone like that with that kind of character Two things. Number one, for him to be of being courted all over the world, yes. to choose here says a lot for what you put together. But what's he going to do for this area and bringing the recognition from the rest of the world to what's happening here? Hey, hey real quick, before Burke answers that, I want to thank you, and I'd like to publicly thank Gov Governor Ducey. As you mentioned, when we were courting Didier Drugba and he came to Arizona, you went out of your way to have a lunch with us to represent the media community with Didier and let him know the real interest that's here among people who grew up as football players, right? Our governor came out, and I'll tell you what, 
when I see this governor, when I see Governor Doug Ducey work for economic development and helping us position our state for international opportunities such as this, I was so thankful he was our governor. He was great that day, and he, was, he seemed to be so impressed. He, was, he sat right across from him yes. and was just so laser focused on what he had to say. And I think a lot of it has to do with as much of what a human being he is as, as well as being the superstar athlete that it he is. It really helped us out. No, I'm really glad, I, I, yeah. I knew it would. He's, he's, yeah. Well, you've known the governor for quite a while. Yeah. So tell me about what he's going to do for this. What do you think he'll do? Because the rest of the world will see him and want to know of all the places in the world you could choose. Why so here? it's already happening before him being here. I, I got in tweet, tweets, Facebook messages, Instagram messages, text messages from people around the world that I have never met before. I was at dinner yesterday with my wife and kids, and I had a gentleman, elderly gentleman, run to me and gave me a hug and said thank you for bringing Didier to you know, Phoenix. Wow. So, I mean, it's already happening. Um, and and to, to your point on his options, and, and I, I, I was listening to some of the interviews that he gave to BBC and New York Times, and he talked about how he was courted by not only China and India, but uh, Premier League is still in England. And, and you're talking about you know, some uh, clubs in uh, Turkey, some MLS clubs. So he had at least 10 options uh, to go, but we have, shown him something that is uh, unique and, and he's certainly up for the challenge and as I mentioned before he's certainly seen the opportunity that we have and how Phoenix was very well positioned. So I think he's going to bring his leadership. Uh, Jose Mourinho, his coach at Chelsea, once very famously said Didi is one of those players that doesn't need a, the captain band to be a leader in the locker room. So he has a, a tremendous leadership so for our younger players to learn from him um, just it, technical stuff, but also character and, and how to get ready for it. He's known as the, the man of uh, bigger matches, right? I mean, he's a dozen of cups you're talking about uh, throughout his career, and he's always the man of the match, somebody that's scoring, somebody that mentally prepares himself very well for, uh, for those big moments. That's just the soccer part of things, right? And to Tim's point, to be able to aspire and inspire the, the young generation, um, to even get younger generation of uh, players to be able to say that they played with them. Yeah. We have an incredible yeah. competitive advantage. It's not just about money. So for a player, if I was a competitive player in my you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I had three, four different options on other USL teams, even some other MLS teams, and I had a chance to you know, break bread with Didier, be in the same locker room with him, and, and, and play and learn. That's where I'm going. That's I'm, like I'm driving with here. Mario Andretti or right. Tom Steven, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, it doesn't get any better no. to learn that way. And, and I'm also excited about the charitable things that we can do. 100%. And we haven't even broken that ice yet. But for, for the charity, charity that we can bring in through, through his appearances and his leadership, um, I'm really looking forward to establishing a foundation um, so we can, we can start that and start feeding that, that out to charities. Right. And you're talking about somebody that's extremely influential, right? I mean, in his own country, you're talking about somebody that put tens of thousands of kids to school and to scholarships and he gets the credit for stopping a civil war in his country so a very special human being not just a great soccer player but a great leader we've been blessed with a lot of that with the professional teams here in arizona we've got some great leadership to talk about larry fitzgerald some people that are yes. of great character and they're fun to cheer for you want them to succeed you and they're world win. class yes sir. he is every bit of that and i'm i'm excited about it because i just learned about it you guys known him forever but to read about who this person is and that he's coming here it really is like having that ultimate superstar step on the field and saying i almost puts a stamp of approval on the product Agreed. so educate me on the season for Phoenix Rising, home games, how many are there in a season, how is the team in the standings, and if somebody wants to come out to a game, what can they expect to see? Uh, well, we have 16 home games, total of 32 games in the regular season, 16 home, 16 away. Uh, we've played three games, two at home and, and one away so far, and we've won one of those three. We beat, uh, our, in our third game, we beat LA Galaxy, oh, nice. which, which was really yeah, you could Wonderful. see the team coming together, yes. right? Like it's a brand new team with a lot of different players that never played together and it clicked on the third match. And, and to their credit, one of the challenges we had, and, and this is, when we have to self-evaluate as owners. What can we do better next year? One of the real challenges we had this year was a facility for practice. We couldn't assemble our players as soon as a lot of the other teams. And as Burke mentioned, many of our players are playing together for the first time. So it took them you know, the first two games, the first two weeks were really still part of a training period. They were playing against teams that had played together 
twice as long in preseason and for several years even on that team prior. So for us to come out in the third game and beat a team as strong as LA Galaxy and have as many, we, we won that game two to one and we had so many scoring opportunities there. We could have won seven to one. I mean, it was, right. it was a crazy, exciting game. over a dozen shots at goal. Nice. Yeah, nice. so they're really gelling. The excitement, because it's an intimate stadium, there's not a bad seat in the house. You can see the pitch from anywhere, and we didn't spare any expense on the development of that field. It's, it's as oh, it's high gorgeous. quality of a, a soccer pitch you'd see, and it's FIFA compliant. So it's an internationally qualified pitch, so we can host all kinds of matches there and treat Arizonans to the best in soccer for years to come. So lastly, let's talk about, you mentioned World Cup, possibly coming to North America. This franchise, let's just dream big, this franchise becomes MLS. What does that mean to this franchise if in this area, there's gotta be some of those 60 games that are played in the US have gotta be in the desert Southwest. For, for sure. So they would have to be here. For sure. What is that, and what do you think the World Cup being in North America this time around would mean to American soccer? I mean, if you look at what happened in the 90s and when the World Cup was here and you look at kind of MLS's, if, if there's a chart of the World Cup and MLS uh, expansion fee and how that kind of uh, yeah. correlated, you could have joined MLS in the late 90s for a million bucks. Now you've got to spend $150 million. So I think if you're a student of numbers, it just tells you what the World Cup ignited that popularity of the sport. It's not a coincidence. So I think it's gonna do the same thing again on a different level. Now it's, it's gonna bring it even more mainstream. I mean, even more attention. And Phoenix has a great history of hosting very important international games. You, ma you mentioned Mexico, Uruguay. I was actually there. Yeah, so over, was you know, it over was, 60 years. It was, years. Yeah, it was amazing. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the, the cheers right. and the chants and the songs and the stands, who teaches those? Uh, that, <laughs> that, you know, that's like nothing happens like that in America. It's you watch funny. those international yeah. games, and it's, it's incredible to see that happen. There's Facebook groups about all of these discussions. Yeah, yeah. Jim, some serious Jim can tell you a lot about the support. Grown, it's grown it's men like singing. Sport. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you don't see that in NFL. You know, you no. see grown men fighting in NFL stands. In the, you know, in, in soccer, they used to fight, but now they've kind of calmed that down. But yeah. grown men singing these songs, and it's tiny little bubbles from West Ham. And Banditos, you know, our guys, they have a bunch of songs that they come up with. And you just kind of learn it uh, uh, through by, you know, sitting with them and partying with them and, and learning the words. But it's, uh, it's, you can't beat a live soccer game. I was in England uh, last October, and I went to an Everton-Chelsea game. I mean, not Everton, it was uh, Arsenal-Chelsea. What, what an amazing... I mean, if we can get that kind of energy here in the U.S., and there it is. Look at Seattle. They have the yeah. parades, um, you know, and you see some of that. But they get some of that energy here. And what's great about where we are, um, we're right across from Tempe Marketplace. So there's a pathway for a parade already set for the, the, the fans to, to parade into the stadium. So we're, we're already envisioning kind of how that's going to look and how that's going to work. But, but to bring that energy to, to Arizona would just make my day. And, and to, to your point, you, you talked about this before, because there's no timeouts and the, it's a continuous clock, it's, you don't know how time flies and it's not a whole day thing. You're in the middle of action the minute the match starts all the way to the end. And it's one of those sports that I would strongly argue that it, you can read the game so much better by being there. It's kind of like hockey. Right. The experience is just so much better and you can see what's going on when the ball is not there, which is also a very important part of the game. And you can only experience that live, and you can do that less than two hours, and it's an unbelievable experience. I became a converted hockey fan growing up in Florida and living in Arizona for 22 right. years because I went to a hockey game. And when you go, you see, and soccer's the same way. I watched the World Cup, but so casually, because I don't know, you know so much more about the game than I do. But to see the excitement and to see world-class athletes at their best and then in competition with each other there's nothing like that tournament because it just seems like every team has got a chance and they are just so good at what they do it's amazing what they're able to to do with that ball yeah every moment you know in american football when when that rare moment when somebody takes a punt or or they take a kickoff and they run it all the way back right that just incredible speed yeah. and sportsmanship that everybody's like wow in, in soccer, that happens every few minutes. Yeah, you, you, you have people sprinting at max speed. You have this incredible sportsmanship with the ball yeah. and these touches and these, these plays where the people are firing a ball across and guys are flying through the air like Larry Fitzgerald, but they're not allowed to touch it. They've got to use their head yeah, to nail yeah. it in. And it's just really something to watch. 
When you, um, this season, when is the season finale? It goes through when in the regular season and then when are the playoffs? It goes through mid-October, okay. regular season. And when we make the playoffs, we'll continue into November. So if we could make it all the way to the championship match, it would be right near the end of the first week or early the second week of November. Okay, and is it like um, football playoffs where you would play against home and away? Would it be based on record when you hosted home games? Is that how it works? Okay. Yes. Yeah, hopefully I told you, I'm a, I'm a new fan. I'm learning. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so it, the potential for that is real, that if oh, you yeah. can make the playoffs, you could host some playoff games. Right here. How about media attention? Have you gotten pretty good media coverage yet? This is my third interview today. Oh, it is? Good. Yes. So how about games? <laughs> when are the games going to be covered? I mean, are you, gonna, are you getting working yeah, so, on that stuff? So thanks for, for asking that. We're so fortunate Cox, Cox Media came in right at the beginning all 32 of our games are broadcast yeah. live on Cox 7 okay. and 1007, 1007 in HD. Also, they're doing replays and on demand. So for free, if you miss a match, you can go on to Cox anytime, look us up and on demand and see those matches that you might have missed. And it's all 32 games across the entire state of Arizona, 1.7 1. million households can see our games live if they'd like to. Tim, do we have one of the highest viewership in YouTube and, you know, TV in our league, league? In our league, league, we're top in the charts. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, with, that's uh, what I told with, with YouTube. So the USL has a YouTube channel and we're, we're racking up 10,000 viewers a, a game Well, already, that's going to triple when Didier shows up. I mean, yeah. That's, that's going to quadruple when he shows up. So, And, and we were voted the, the best uh, logo. That is an awesome yeah, logo. So. And, the, and the funnest the, team the in one who created this logo. Who came up with this logo? Thank you. He's got a great marketing team. And I was going to say, he's got to have a great team because that is the Phoenix Rising. It's it, yeah, the red logo. And that, when you, that may have been what got Didier here. I, it was the beer. <laughs> I'm telling you, the logo is nice, but the beer is spectacular. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't stop yeah. sipping that's on it. That's exactly right. It's wonderful. So people need to head by the stadium. You need to drive past it, not just on the freeway. It went up so quickly. We talked about it, and you said, days, yeah. From zero to and I remember feeling like it was a week because I remember it was going up. I saw the beginnings of the trucks out there, and then it seemed like it went by three days later, and it was up and, and operational. So you weren't lying when you said to me, it's going to be ready to go. I couldn't believe you got that up that quickly. But it's a world-class facility. The team is going to be something to watch for years to come. And I can't wait for the news that you guys are going to be an MLS franchise. That's going to be pretty cool. That's going to be pretty cool. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Listen, Phoenix Rising. Chuck, what's the website? Where can they find you online? PHXRisingFC.com. PHXRisingFC.com. Check out the team. Check out a game. I'm definitely going to go to a game. But i got to sit with you because you got to teach me. Yeah, sit with you me. you got to show me. I'll show you the, show you the ropes. All right, I'll buy the beer. Okay. Because you deal. always buy them when I'm here. <laughs> I'll buy the beer there. And we'll go to, I would love to go to a match together. You bet. Anytime. All right, All right. Anytime. thanks, guys. Thank I appreciate you. it. You're third today. What a trooper you are. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.